My first ever big buck bulk hill was taken in 1969 on my first ever public land freelance hunt. And the sheer adrenaline rush that this buck gave me put me over the edge concerning wanting to learn as much as I could about whitetail behavior. And especially about mature buck behavior because it was becoming very obvious to me that the mature buck behavior was quite different than the behavior of the few other deer I had shot and had encounters with. There was very little information about hunting white-tailed deer in general back then, and what there was was all about gun hunting. There was literally zero information about bow hunting or hunting mature bucks. It was, if there was any information, it was just about hunting deer. I did own a book by Leonard Lee Rue III, but it was a general information book about white-tailed behavior, and it was probably behavioral studies done in some form of an enclosure. So it really didn't mean much concerning the deer I was hunting on public land. I'm going to give you a considerable amount of background on me back in those days. 1969 was also the year I graduated from North Hill High School. And it was kind of interesting and my mother was relatively mad at me because I did not attend my graduation proceedings because my brother and I drove to Canada and went lake hopping, fishing for walleyes, and stopped at some rivers and fished for brook trout. And these are a few of the jobs I had leaning up to 1969 and maybe a couple of years even after that. As a young kid, every winter when we'd get a decent snowfall, I would walk around the neighborhood knocking on doors and shoveling driveways and sidewalks for a buck to three bucks per. And typically it was an old man or an old lady that just couldn't do that type of work anymore. There was also a horse track in town called Northville Downs and it's still there. It's a harness track and when I was between the age of 9 and 12 every Saturday in the summer I would go to the grocery store at Kroger and grab me a grocery cart out of the parking lot and I would push it down to the stable area which was probably about six or seven blocks away and I would go back into the stable areas and collect beer and pop bottles and then I would take them home and I would wash them because they would have horse poop on them. A lot of them were just thrown into the straw inside the stables. They were laying all over the place and I would take them, after I washed them, I'd take them back up to Kroger, give them their cart back and cash the bottles in for two, their two cent deposits. And I would get about six to eight dollars every Saturday doing that bottle collection and six to eight dollars back in uh, back in the early 60s was a lot of money. I also had a Detroit Free Press paper route when I was I think 12, 11 or 12 through the age of 13. I know those don't exist anymore but basically you ride a bike and you had bags on the back of the bike on a rack and you had just a lot of newspapers and you'd throw them on porches or walk them up to porches for people that subscribe to the Detroit Free Press. I also worked as a dishwasher in a couple of different restaurants during the summer and I hated doing that, but it was a good learning experience. I worked a couple of winters in a five and dime store as a stock boy. I would check in inventory and put it in the warehouse. One of my most favorite jobs was I was a rack boy at a local pool hall for several winters after school. And instead of paying me a lot of money, he paid me a little bit of money, but he let me play pool for free. They also had snooker tables. They had two snooker tables in the back, and that's typically what I played for free on. And snooker tables are very large, and once you play on a snooker table and learn how to shoot soft, going to a regular eight-foot pool table was like shooting pool balls into a basketball hoop. It was relatively simple because on a snooker table you had to hit you had to hit your shots perfectly because the corners were rounded and balls would just bounce out if you didn't hit it slow and perfectly in into the hole and as far as what I mean by a rack boy because I don't see them anymore the main game people were playing was nine ball they were playing money money pool basically there was money on the five and the nine and every time they would finish the rack somebody would knock the nine ball and they would just yell rack and I would just walk over and and give them a rack. I also caddied at Meadowbrook Country Club for four years from the age to 13 and 17 and one of the highlights of my caddy career 
was caddying for Marvin Gaye at a pro-am at Detroit Country Club. Caddying was kind of cool, and I loved it because I always had a nice tan. My hair always turned blonde, bleached blonde in the summer. And once in a while, you'd get to carry doubles, which was basically two bags. And then once in a great while, if you were really good to the caddy master, he'd let you work the parking lot on Saturday or Sunday. And by working the parking lot, basically you were just, every time a card pull in the parking lot, you'd go over there, and if it was one or two guys, you'd take the clubs out of their trunks and take them over to the bag, bag drop. And usually they would give you a buck a bag. So it was pretty easy to make 80 to 100 bucks a day back then doing the parking lot. And that was a serious amount of money. My first real job, I consider a real job because it included I had to pay start paying taxes and stuff, was the year I graduated from from high school, I worked at Northville State Mental Hospital for a year as an attendant nurse. And that, to say the least, was a real wake-up call for appreciating my health and mental capacities. I almost turned around and walked back out the very first day I walked into that job. Basically, I unlocked the door with a key. I had on this white uniform. There was no schooling involved in this job. You were just a body taking care of patients. Uh, and when I opened the door and started walking down the hallway there was an old man sitting against the wall and he was for lack of a better term he was beating off i went farther down the hall and there was a young man smoking a cigarette and the cigarette was all the way down between his fingers the burn mark was actually burning his fingers and he didn't even notice it his fingers where he was holding his cigarette were basically black from being burnt so much there was two showers down the hall off to the side basically it was an open doorway with showers and there was a retarded man sitting on the floor under one of the showers and it was cold running water running all over this guy and he actually had his clothes on and i just turned around walked back out and then i walked down the aisle and went into the office because the office the office is in the middle of this long hallway and it's got glass windows that stick out into the hallway where you can look down the hallways both directions and then there was day rooms off to the side that you could see into as well with where patients would sit and watch TV. It kind of reminded me a little bit of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. There was one patient that was very interesting. He was a normal young man when he was put in this mental facility. His mother was a single mom so he he his father was totally out of his life and she worked and this kid had seizures about once or twice a week and mom couldn't take care of him and work so and she couldn't afford somebody to watch him so she just put him in a mental institution and during the full year that i was there i never saw her visit her son and this guy was normal when he came in there according to all of the other attendants that had been there for a lot of years and, and being around all of these mental patients definitely had taken its toll on this guy. He was becoming very suicidal. There was another young man, and he was like 18 years old, and he was one of those mathematical rain men, like you'd see on the movie. Basically, you could give him a seven-digit oddball number multiplied by another seven-digit oddball number, and he would write the answer down. You could give him... A seven digit number and have a five digit number divided into that seven digit number and he'd write the answer down up above with the remainder without doing any math whatsoever you just write the answer down I thought that was really really rare so we used to have University of Michigan football players come over to the hospital once a week and they were taking some sort of a easy subject where they just got to come in and talk to mental patients and this one lady, she was probably 22, I asked her, I showed her this fella, and she said, yeah, that's, it, while that's rare, it's not totally uncommon. But I thought that was r really interesting. And one of the strange things about this guy is, other than him being this Rain Man mathematician, he was relatively dumb. There was several times when I would do bed checks where he was giving fellatio to men in their private rooms and it just got to the point where I became numb to it. I'd say, 
Richard, what are you doing? And he'd say uh, what he was doing. And I'd say, why? And he said, because he asked me to. I mean, that's how mentally unstable a lot of these people were. They just had no comprehension of reality. There were a few retarded patients that had to be physically moved from one area to another for eating and for going to bed. Some of the out of control patients, actually we would send them to get electric shock treatments, which was a scary, scary deal because when they would come back into the day rooms, they were out of it. And some other ones would take, they would just give sedatives to. Once in a while, you'd get a patient that was just obstinate and he was a big person that you couldn't handle. And whenever we had a patient like that, we would send him to another ward because there was probably 50 to 70 wards on this hospital, different wards. It took up almost a half of a section. This was a monster hospital with buildings all over the grounds. And we would send these obstinate patients over to a different ward where you literally had to be six foot tall and weigh X amount of pounds to even work on these wards. And I don't know what they did to these patients, but when the patients came back, they behaved and did everything you asked them to do. So whatever they did on those wards was definitely not cool. It was very common to see male and female patients alike that would basically play with their private parts most of the day. I'll never forget, there was one guy, his name was Byron, and he was a germaphobic person. And he always ate alone in the lunchroom, and these lunchrooms were relatively large. And whenever anyone in this huge dining areas would sneeze, he would pick up his tray of food, he'd run over to the window, because there was a bank of windows that you would just unlock, and they would kind of pull forward a little bit at an angle, and then he would wave fresh air over his food so that there weren't any germs landing on it. There was another time I had a pretty tall patient. He was probably six foot tall. I'm 5'8", and we were just calmly talking to each other, and he just out of nowhere punched me right in the face, and my nose was bleeding, and he gave me a black eye. And as soon as he punched me, you know, I'm, I, he, I staggered over and I start to stand back up and he started talking like nothing ever happened. And some other attendants saw this happen and they ran over and grabbed him and put him in a chokehold. And I could just tell this guy really had no concept of what just happened. He was mentally that messed up. And I just told him to, hey, let the dude go and I don't want to file a report on this. And I never had an issue with that guy again. And it, just strange things happen at that place. Probably the worst incident, however, was uh, a patient wouldn't turn the channel when another guy wanted to watch another TV show. And he went behind him and grabbed a chair and busted it over the guy's back. And he went, he went into uh, the hospital area of the mental hospital. And I never saw him again. The job, without question, made me rethink my health and mental stability and appreciate the fact that many others are not quite as fortunate. It was a total wake-up call and was a job I will never, ever forget. It's too bad that almost all of the mental institutions, like the one I worked at, had been shut down because they were just too expensive for the government to run. There are so many mentally sick people in this country that, are, that seriously need to be off the streets. And they are the ones doing the overwhelming majority of these mass shootings that we see on TV all the time. I struggle to comprehend the patients that I was overseeing are now, not those patients, but the same type of patients, are on the streets. They're homeless or they're in some form of a home where their government's paying them to take care of them, but they are still walking the streets and they are mentally unstable and they could do anything, could trigger them to do anything at any point in time. It actually appalls me that there are so many ignorant people that want to ban guns instead of addressing the real problems, which is mental illness. I also worked at a small metals factory and we made uh, mortar projectiles for the Vietnam War effort. It was probably the most dangerous job I had ever had. Uh, and I remember one person, he got killed because he put one of these two pound metal blanks into the die and these dies are like eight inches wide and 12 inches thick and they're hardened steel 
and he put a part in there and somebody talked to him and he turned around and talked for a minute and then he forgot he put the part in there because it sinks down to the bottom in this die and he put another one in in it and then he hit the two buttons in the front and the the press came down and that die exploded and sent parts parts of that steel into his chest and he walked back about 10 feet and fell over dead presses in this place were huge they were uh, 20 feet tall or taller uh, the one that he got killed from was a, a Baumgarth press and that was made in Germany he was also an alcoholic and he usually because this was during the evening shift he usually came in a little bit tanked and he was probably somewhat drunk at the time and drugs were very prevalent back then uh, on the evening shift when you'd take breaks guys would go out in the parking lot and smoke hash and and take speed and there were many other serious injuries in that little factory as the raw steel rods came in three inch diameter by 18 foot long lengths and they had to be chopped into two inch long chunks and then those chunks would go into a metal grate and then be dropped into an acid bath and I remember there was one guy that was working you know he was running those grates dropping them into the acid bath he used to take a lot of qualudes roar 17 714 qualudes and he actually fell into the acid bath once and obviously we rushed him out of there and got him under a shower but uh, he had some skin infections from that pretty bad my recollection of that November 1969 kill was still vividly imprinted into my mind when I actually wrote this article that I'm reading right now and I wrote it in 1971. Back then bow hunting was immensely different than it is now. There was no let them go, let them grow stuff going on and every bow and gun hunter targeted any legal three inch antlered buck. There also were not the quantity of deer that there are today and an interesting statistic is less than 2% of licensed bow hunters back then killed an antlered buck every year and about 7% of licensed hunters killed a deer which means they shot does and fawns. In the past 25 years or so statistically between 25 and 35% of licensed bow hunters kill an antlered buck and a good percentage of those guys are passing on one and a half and two and a half year old bucks. So there's a lot more deer nowadays and they're a lot, lot bigger because people are letting them go. Or at least a lot of people let them go. Also, nowadays about 50 plus percent of licensed bow hunters put a tag on a deer every year. There was no such thing as holding out for a trophy. If a three inch spike passed by, he got shot at him and if he was killed, it was without question bragging time if you shot it with a bow. Killing any antlered buck with a bow back then was a very big deal. Killing a two and a half year old eight point with a 14 inch spread would probably be the biggest buck taken in that entire county the whole year. There were also around a million licensed gun hunters in Michigan back then and they didn't pass on anything either, making two and a half year olds very, very rare sightings. Today, two and a half year old bucks are relatively common. I see them all the time during season, but I pass on them because I'm trying to kill book bucks, three or four year olds. It's, it's just a different day. There was an upside to bow hunting back then, however. Getting permission to bow hunt was relatively easy. I primarily hunted public land back then, but when I did ask somebody for permission, it was pretty normal to hear you want to do what? Like, you actually want to go out and try and bow hunt and kill a deer? It was that rare? And uh, they would usually say, hey, <laughs> knock yourself out. And they'd tell you their property lines and go for it. Now, if you asked them to gun hunt, that was another story. Because everybody gun hunted back then. So getting gun hunting permission was almost impossible. The numbers of deer back then were so low because I was hunting in southern Michigan, which is an agricultural area. And all the ag areas back then were maintained very well. The fence rows were clean. There, you didn't see any CRP fields. Um, there wasn't any anti-hunters that had properties you couldn't hunt. There wasn't any soil conservation clubs. Basically, everything got gun hunted if there was deer there. So seeing a two and a half year old deer was very, very rare. This may sound strange to a lot of you hunters under the age of 50, but in the large agricultural areas of 
all of the big states today, like your Iowa's, your Kansas, uh, Central Illinois, Nebraska, Missouri, the Dakotas, uh, Northern Indiana, Northern Ohio, where there's just a lot of ag and small woodlots and stuff, there were very few deer. Just seeing a deer track back in the 60s and 70s and probably even into the early 80s was a big deal. And if you don't believe me, uh, ask your gramps. Farms were kept very tidy and there was very minimal security cover, which is what it takes for deer to flourish and survive through gun season. Nowadays, there are CRP fields, there's overgrown fence rows, uh, what used to be pastures are now big stands of timber. Farms have been busted up into smaller parcels and some of them are turned into suburbs and exurbs, you know, 20, 30 miles outside of the bigger cities where either hunting is not allowed anymore or access is, is extremely difficult. And a lot of those areas are bow hunt only because there's too many houses, but they used to be farms. There are also many anti-hunters that own great habitat property and they don't allow access. Enough rhetoric about that, let's get back to the hunt. The public area I was hunting was primarily made up of rolling hills with oaks, maples, black cherries, beech, and popples on the ridges in the high ground and cedars, hemlock, red brush, marsh grasses, and cattails in the lower wet swampy areas. The closest crop fields were miles away. I didn't know much about preferred foods back then other than Leroy had always told me two things to keep eye, an eye out for on public land where it's primarily just timber were apple trees and primarily oaks. And back then it wasn't a white oak or a red oak thing, it was just oaks. Um, and there was a lot of apple trees on a lot of public lands down in southern Michigan because there used to be a lot of old apple orchards and a lot of the actual public lands used to be pastures where cows would they'd feed ap apples they'd feed apples to cows and they would shit the seeds out and there'd be an apple tree here or there and it's still like that there's still lost apple trees on a lot of the public lands in zone three. Obviously, I didn't know the difference between white oak and red oaks and that deer preferred whites over reds due to their significantly lower bitter tannins. The swampy areas were relatively large on this huge piece of public land and they kind of wound through all of the low ground. This would be my first ever freelance hunt where I just went in the woods, looked for a feeding location or some form of a lot of sign, set up a ground blind and hunted. Hunting from trees at the time was also illegal. Through the hard knocks of Leroy using me as a guinea pig while he was supposedly mentoring me, uh, I actually learned how to hunt the wind because he used to put me in areas where deer would win me, skirt me, and hopefully go and give him an opportunity. Uh, and Leroy also used to use milkweed as far back as into the 50s. Uh, that old school method of throwing up milkweed seeds and letting them drift and see where they run. And I did that as well back then. The wind was mild and out of the northwest that day. So I was skirting through the timber on the southerly sides of the swampy areas looking for some form of food or fresh sign. I forgot to mention, but I was just hunting for a deer. I likely would have even shot a nice little button buck had I had the opportunity. Just telling it like it is, it was a different period of time when you couldn't purchase your way to killing big bucks. You actually had to learn how to hunt. I found a couple oaks about 15 yards on the southerly side of a wet marshy area that had interspersed cattails, marsh grasses, dry humps within it, patches of red brush throughout it. And there were still lots of acorns on the ground along with fresh droppings. There were two runways coming out of the swamp and they went right to the oaks and then there was a single, just like there always is, there was an individual runway that transitioned along the outside edge of the marsh. And there was a couple rubs on the red brush bordering the marsh. Again, I didn't know the differences in acorns at the time, but looking back, the acorns under these trees were small. They weren't quarter size, they were dime size. So both of these trees were white oaks, which are what deer prefer. I was shooting a 45 pound, 60 inch long Ben Pearson recurve bow with five inch feather fletched 30 inch cedar arrows tipped with MA3 three blade broadheads. Within 20 yards of the oaks was a large deadfall 
and when it had tipped over it uprooted and that dished out area of earth at the base of the uprooted tree was where I was going to put my ground line. Even though the prevailing wind was in my favor and most of the foliage was down, which aids in stifling swirling winds, while standing in the dished out spot I pulled out some milkweed to test for thermals and swirling winds. It was good as the seed slowly drifted south in the prevailing wind direction. This was a pretty cool setup as the uprooted earth didn't require much work and the root system in front of it had peak holes that I could actually look through. A deer coming out of the swamp or feeding at the oaks would have a difficult time seeing me through this dense root system. I would however have to move to the side of the roots or stand up to take a shot as the gaps in the roots were too small to shoot through. To make my ground blind I removed all the leaves and small branches from the dished out area where the roots used to be. I wanted bare dirt so if I shuffled my feet when it was time to take a shot or I had to move over to the side I didn't want to be able to make any noise. I also had brought a little tiny folding stool which is what I sat on. I remember it was a cloudy day and the temperature was in the low 40s. My exterior suit was a pair of OD green coveralls that I always left hanging in an outside shed to let air out the best as possible. Of course, knowing what I know now, that was a waste of time as my odor would be permeating through it within a short period of time anyway as soon as I started hunting. I had on a set of old white long johns and I had a couple sweatshirts underneath my coveralls as layering garments for my upper body. Had I brought my 20 gauge shotgun, I could have easily taken my 5 squirrel limit as there were fox squirrels picking up and burying acorns all evening. About a half an hour before dark I heard a deer moving through the wet swamp and it was coming towards the oaks. The deadfall blocked my visual into the marsh and it was driving me crazy that I couldn't see. When the deer got to the swamp's edge it stopped for what seemed like 20 minutes but it was probably more like about 30 seconds. The area in front of the deer must have passed its feeling comfortable test because it began moving across the dry noisy leaves towards the oaks. As I peeked through the tangle of roots I could make out antlers and they were gigantic. Here I am trying to kill any deer and right in front of me is the biggest bodied and antlered buck I had ever seen. He moved up into the oaks and began feeding on acorns. He was facing directly at me at first and he would lower his head, pick up an acorn, lift his head back up and go on full alert mode with his ears moving side to side while crunching on the noisy acorn. After a couple minutes he must have eaten all the acorns under his head and he slightly shifted his body to his right to search for more acorns. With that move he was now quartering towards me at about 15 yards and that was all I could handle. My adrenaline was through the roof and when he leaned down to sniff the ground for his next acorn I slid to the side and raised my bow for the shot. I was shaking so bad that I actually had to cant my bow slightly to the side so the arrow wouldn't fall off the bench. Being a snap instinctive shooter with no sights, I aimed at the back crease of his left shoulder and as soon as my glove touched the corner of my mouth, I let the arrow go. Thank God the arrow hit where I aimed and as I watched him wheel, I could see quite a bit of the arrow sticking out of the entry side. Yep, even though I hit the deer where I was aiming, he was quartering forward enough that I knew the arrow never touched his lungs. The arrow may have slightly hit liver, but it definitely went into his stomach and possibly penetrated far enough to get into his intestines. He turned and ran back into the swamp exactly where he came out and kept running until I couldn't hear him anymore, which was well over 100 yards. I knew he was well out of earshot so I felt comfortable getting out of the blind and I went over to where I hit him and while there there was some brown hairs on the ground but there was no blood whatsoever. And with an arrow that didn't penetrate what can you expect because you don't have an exit hole. Then I went over to where he entered the swamp which was about a 15 yard distance of running and there on the ground was about 12 inches of my 30 inch long arrow. It must have broken off as he ran through the red brush bordering the edge of the swamp. The fletch on the arrow was clean as a whistle with no sign of blood. One of the things I had also learned from Leroy was that if you aren't certain of the hit being good, always get out and leave the deer alone for at least four hours and if the weather permits and it's cold enough, leave it for eight hours. So I decided to leave the deer overnight. There were no coyotes in southern Michigan back then so the thought of predators finding him and eating him never even crossed my mind. 
Wearing some hip boots, I took up the search the next morning. Leroy, Leroy had always told me that if a deer is shot through the liver or in the guts, they typically don't go very far before they get sick and they bed down. But they typically like to bed down in some form of security cover. And of course, the bigger the deer, the farther distance they go before they bed down because their strides are bigger. I couldn't find any blood, so I took off through the swamp in the direction I heard him run. When I got near the area where I think I had last heard him running, about 50 to 60 yards in front of me, I heard something move and I looked up and saw that buck struggling to get up and he did get up and he slowly started walking away briskly. I didn't have my bow with me. I figured he would be dead and I knew if I pushed him anymore, it wouldn't help the recovery. So I went to get some help. A couple years prior, I had gone up north in December to bow hunt some public land with Leroy up by Alpena, and Leroy had a couple buddies that were up there already hunting on the same public land. They were both around 30 years old, and they were pretty big men. They were in their 30s. Leroy was about 35, and one of them was 6'7", and one was 6'5". I was 18. That December, I had asked those guys for their phone numbers because at the time I wasn't old enough to drive. So I was always looking for any opportunity I could to go bow hunting and sometimes Leroy wasn't available. So I got their numbers. I didn't call Leroy that day to come look because Leroy was the type of guy that if there wasn't anything in it for him, there was no way he was going to put any work forth, work effort into a recovery for me. He was way too competitive and had way too big of an ego and he was also extremely lazy. When I called those two big men and told them about the scenario of shooting this big buck and asked if they would help me, they both said, hell yes. They were all in. These guys were kind of crazy anyway and uh, I knew this was going to be kind of interesting. I can remember my first encounter with the six foot seven guy, his name was Bill. And uh, Leroy and I were picking him up after an evening hunt. And again, this was back in December on public land up near Alpena. I don't remember the year, but it was snowing like crazy. And when we stopped to pick him up, he stepped out from behind this tree and he looked like the abominable snowman. He was totally covered in snow and he was just a monster of a man and he intimidated the hell out of me. Back to the story. I told them we would be going through some knee-high deep water in some of the areas of the swamp and they said we don't care and they both, they both showed up with their leather work boots on and jeans. It was around 2 p.m. when we entered the swamp and as we slowly neared the area the buck moved to after I bumped him, we could see the buck's antlers in the marsh grass about 40 yards in front of us. He was definitely bedded up in front and he was not dead yet. I brought my bow and you would probably think we were going to sneak up and I'd get another shot. No, that's not what they wanted to do. These guys both took off running through the wet marsh as if it were a race. I just stood there and watched in disbelief. As they neared the buck, the buck struggled to get up and move away. But within several seconds, they caught him and literally knocked him off his feet and jumped on him immediately. Now it was getting really interesting. One of them was hanging on to his antlers for dear life and the other was lying flat out on the buck's body in an attempt to keep the buck's legs down so he couldn't get back up or kick them. They had never done this before and had no concept of the strength of a wounded deer, let alone a big bodied buck. They quickly realized that this buck still had a lot in him and he wasn't going to give up easily. As big as these guys were, they were yelling at me like little kids to come over and kill this deer. These two big strong men were struggling big time to hold this deer down and it was getting serious. I was probably 40 or 50 yards from these guys when they yelled at me to come and shoot this deer. And I ran over there, but there was no way with this deer trying to move around and these two big bodies laying on his carcass that I was going to take a chance shooting him with an arrow. That was not an option in my mind. While this was a serious situation, watching these two big guys wrestling with this adrenaline-driven buck was also quite 
it reminded me of a mud wrestling competition, and I wouldn't say the big guys were necessarily winning. I could see it in their eyes that they were actually scared. And that was confirmed when one of them said, if you don't hand me your knife, I'm going to kill you when this is over. So I handed him my six inch long sheath knife. Ever watch a live deer get stabbed in the neck with a knife? All it does is piss him off. The big eight point became more enraged and energetic with every stab. And I told them, you guys need to slice that buck's throat from one side to the other and cut the juggler. Otherwise, it will take a long time for that deer to die from your puncture wounds. I had assumed they would know that. I was 18. I knew that. These guys were 30. But I think I had killed more deer than they had, actually. Bill took the knife and sliced that buck's neck from one side to the other. And I watched as the blood started to spurt out from the juggler. And within 30 seconds, the buck finally expired. I think had I been older, they would have beat me up for laughing at them during this fiasco. But after some brief yelling... They were over it and started to congratulate me on such a big buck. They'd been bow hunting for quite a few years, each of them, and neither of them had ever taken a buck that big. I was a bit wet from them splashing around, and I had on my hip boots. They were both drenched from head to toe in muddy marsh water. Other than them trying not to get killed themselves by that crazed buck, they actually loved the experience, and that is exactly what it was. It was an experience, and I'm sure, even to this day, they tell people about it. Without even gutting that buck, these guys ran that buck through the wet swamp and woods and threw him in the back of their pickup truck, and I got in my car, and we headed out. We went to my house and hung him in the garage. I've had some crazy things happen over the years, but that was the most comical after the shot, deer hunting scenario I've ever witnessed. But hey, they made the recovery and I guess being big guys does have its advantages. It was a beautiful eight point buck with tall tines and while I never weighed him, he had to be over 200 pounds trust. When I gutted him in the garage, the stomach was sliced open and there was stomach matter throughout the buck's entire body cavity and he smelled a bit rancid. All the meat was tainted with that gut shot smell and I ended up throwing all the meat away. While the buck was hanging in the garage, my cousin came over and she took a picture of me trying to bend the buck's neck around and that's the only picture I have. It's hard to see because of the way I'm twisting his head, but just below the neck, above that white spot, that neck is sliced all the way from side to side. Damn near from spine to spine on the other side. I didn't own a camera back then, which was kind of a shame because I had shot some other deer and I never got pictures of them. Uh, and I finally broke down in 1975 and I bought a camera, but cameras back then were a different story too. Again, it was a hunt that I will never ever forget. And one of my most enjoyable hunts as far as watching these two guys chase this buck down thought they were big badass men and that buck damn near took them to town and that buck was half dead when he did it. It really opened their eyes on the strength of an animal and it blew me away that that buck could push those big men around laying on top of him like he was doing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this kill story. It's definitely the most strange recovery that I've ever had and I hope I never have to have anything like that again. It was definitely the most strange recovery I've ever had and ever will have. Thanks for taking in another episode of Eberhard Outdoors.